Well, who would have thunk someone could write intriguing and vivid stories about reforestation? Charlotte Gill has done it in spades. She writes about herself and a small band of ragged fortune seekers who rebuild our forest one tree at a time in her soon-to-be prize-winning book called Eating Dirt. Charlotte planted her first tree at 19. Last count, she had planted over 1 million plus seedlings. It is my pleasure to welcome Charlotte Gill to Studio 4 to tell us more. Hi. 1 million plus seedlings. That's a lot of little trees. Yeah, I stopped counting at a million. It's probably somewhere around a million and a half. Mm. And do most tree planters count? Uh, we count for a while. Probably we ex exaggerate a little bit. Mm -hmm. When you're a rookie. Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. What did you know about planting trees when you started? I got interested in planting trees. I went planting for the first time just totally by accident. I had a roommate in university and she went out every summer and came back in the fall and had these just wild and crazy stories about tree planters. And I thought, I really have to try this. And y you know, you can imagine my horror. I thought it was like going to Europe for the summer or, <laughs> you know, summer camp or something mm -hmm. like that. So you can imagine my shock and horror when I arrived there the first time in uh, Northern Ontario, just bug infested, swamp up to the knees, Halo of black oh, yeah. flies. Yeah. Uh, no idea how physically rigorous it is. Well, I had then. never really done any hard physical labor before then. I started at 19. I had been a lifeguard. That was one of my mm -hmm. one and only jobs before I went tree planting. So I really learned a lot those first couple of years. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Yeah. It's a good thing you were 19. Yeah. But what's interesting is some tree planters uh, uh, stay on for quite some time. Well, you did. The average career is about five years, mm. but I stayed for much longer, I think, because there's some addi really addictive quality about it. A lot of my coworkers say they feel like they just keep coming back year after year because there's something about the extremity and the intensity and the beauty of being outdoors that they just love. Well, every day you have a mountain to climb. Yeah, just about every day, especially mm -hmm. in this province. Yes. So you went northern Ontario. That's right. Then to uh, the uh, Canadian Rockies Alberta. or where? Alberta. I was in northern Alberta around uh, in the outer Edmonton area, getting close to the foothills of the Rockies. Mm -hmm. And then you came here. And then I came to British Columbia. Uh, the rain, the fog, the swamp. <laughs> I just love it. I really love the rainforest. There was something mm. about the majesty of those big trees and the fog and the whales and the ocean. Mm. I just really fell in love with it almost instantly. Could you tell the difference between a Douglas fir and a, a, a Sitka spruce or a cedar? I can now. <laughs> I bet you could, but when you started, how does it work? Start the day. Well, uh, usually we leave quite early in the morning and then we'll drive from for, base camp, from a motel. That's right, from a logging camp or a base camp or sometimes a motel. And then we'll drive for half an hour or so, arrive at the site, which is the clear cut. Then we load up with seedlings and those iconic tree planting bags that everybody knows with right. the two pouches on the side and one in the back. And then we head out into the fields for the day. Um, we work almost almost exclusively by ourselves yeah yes you write about that in eating dirt the first day you were alone yes uh, the thoughts that were going through your head well I, I don't think I'd ever really realized how little I had been by myself in life and being out in the field all by yourself with the, where there's really nobody around mm -hmm. in a wild environment where there are animals and weather and all kinds of things. It was really, uh, I really enjoyed it. I loved it. It took some getting used to though. I'm sure. All that quiet. And when you saw your first grizzly bear, tell me about that. You didn't just see one grizzly bear. You saw a grizzly bear with three cubs? Yes. I've Not seen good. two in my life. I've run into two grizzly bears in my life. Mm. And at close range, probably less than 15, 20 feet away. And the first time I was in the Chilcotins, just oh, north of beautiful. here. So and beautiful. I was with my dog and I really didn't even notice the bear. The bear didn't notice me and we both turned around and there we were looking each other in the eyes and my dog just went racing by my right side, chased the dog away. He came back four hours later just covered chased in... Chased the bear away. He chased the bear away. Yeah. 
He came back about four hours later, just covered in mud and burrs and big smile on his face. <laughs> But the day that you saw the grizzly with the uh, sow grizzly, I'm assuming. That's right, yeah. Uh, with with cubs, and the adrenaline started to pump. That's and the occasion I wrote about in the book. That's the time you had to call the chopper. That's right, yeah. Sometimes when we uh, go to work in British Columbia, it's we fly in by helicopter because there's no access by road. Mm -hmm. And on that particular day, I was with my now husband, and uh, we were. It was quite remote, a very foggy day, and we ran into uh, a grizzly sow with three cubs. We saw the cubs first, and uh, we knew we bring our lunches and all our food and whatnot for the day. We knew that she had gotten into our food, and that's why she had arrived there, essentially. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, it was quite terrifying, actually. I'm sure. And at the same time, it was really fascinating. I really wanted the opportunity to see these little grizzly cubs because it's not every day you get to see something <laughs> no, like that. No, but it's not every day that a sow uh, 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 gets the scent of you. Yes. <laughs> you know. Yes. And uh, so what is the uh, safety procedure? Do you have a walkie talk? How does it work? How does the chopper know to come and get you or to scare the cubs away or do something? Well, when it's just two people left alone in a clear cut, we have to have some kind of communication with mm -hmm. uh, someone on the ground. And I was wearing a walkie-talkie on that particular day, and I called for the helicopter. But the he helicopter wasn't, the pilot wasn't sure he could come because the fog was so thick. So we had to wait for a little while. And while we were waiting, we, we thought, okay, well, you know, what is it that we should really be doing in this situation? And I realized every time there's an encounter with a wild animal, the circumstances are totally different. And everything that I had read about how you're supposed to behave with a grizzly bear mm -hmm. really just kind of flew out the window. <laughs> it was a mother grizzly bear with three cubs. Mm -hmm. And you think, do I climb a tree? What tree would I climb? I'm in a clear cut. Well, it became abundantly clear that the, the grizzly sow would really just do anything to protect her children. Exactly. And it's hard to climb a tree when the branches are 150 <laughs> feet up off the ground. I was thinking, <laughs> yeah. So, but you survived. Yes. Mm -hmm. And most of the time, when we run into wild animals, there's no incident at all, mm -hmm. even though we're unarmed, completely unarmed. Well, and they, they really haven't been scared by people so, so much of the time in the remote areas. Yes, that's true. So they don't know you're the enemy, and you're not the enemy in essence, but if you, know, if you are strange. Not acclimatized to human beings at all. No, exactly. Uh, so the day starts early, early? Yes, usually dawn. Dawn, and you're in a crew cab and uh, different ways of getting to the yes, clear cut, picking planes, up the trees. Boats sometimes, um, helicopters. Mm -hmm. And what's the thing uh, when you go up the, the logging road? Uh, because often coming down a logging road is a great big logging truck. That's right. Loaded. That's <laughs> right. You don't want to get hit by that. Well, the, the usual procedure is that there are radios in all the mm -hmm. vehicles. Let's and hope. Then the vehicle, and hopefully, in theory mm -hmm. anyway, uh, the traffic is letting everybody know where they are. How many women do this? Pro not exact number, but is it mostly male? Sometimes it's almost half and half. In the interior where university students do a lot of the work in the summer months, mm -hmm. uh, but on the coast where the season starts sometimes in February when everybody's in school, that number goes way down. It's, it can be as low as 10% or less. Right. So you were uh, a bit of a rare bird at times. I was being definitely female. in the minority at that time mm -hmm. of year, that's for sure. So I bet you had to put up A with the smell and the dirt. Oh, <laughs> but yeah. But B with the jokes. The boys. The fart jokes, right? The boys. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm used to all that stuff. Now. I bet you are. <laughs> uh, we'll come back and talk more with Charlotte Gill, uh, her second book, second book, right? This is my second book, that's uh, right. It's called Eating Dirt. First book, Lady Killer? That's right, fiction. Fiction. Well, this isn't, but it reads like <laughs> fiction sometimes. Uh, we'll come back.